There's a lot of times that uh, we have a lot of questions that we don't have the answers for. And sometimes in church, if you've been at church for any time, you say, well, I already should know that answer. And uh, what we're going to start today is in your bulletin, there's a little form. If you're new to the faith, new to the church, and you just have some questions that you would like to have answered. Now, I'm not talking about fourth level college classes. I'm talking about just questions that you have. I would like to answer those questions for you in a series that we're going to have uh, this month. And today we're talking about questions. I, I put my faith in Jesus. Now what do I do? What do I do on this beginning step? We just baptized all these in, individuals, and at the end of the service, we're going to have them come down to the front, and we're going to have some people join the church. What is all that about? What does all that mean? Do I really know my faith is in Jesus Christ? Am I just trying to be a good guy? Am I trying to just do what the right thing is to do? Am I trying to blend into the Christian environment? Or am I really a follower of Jesus Christ? Sometimes we want to blend in. Sometimes we don't really have all the answers. I want to be a follower of Christ. I want to know what Christ has done for me. But do we have that faith? So what do we ask? What are those questions that we might have? Uh, the first answer I would say is make sure you, you understand what salvation is all about. If we do not understand what salvation is all about, we can blend into the popular culture of Christianity and say, as long as I go to church, as long as I don't do things wrong, as long as I'm better than the other guy, I'm okay. But true Christianity is not just that I am a follower of Christ. I am a dedicated follower of Jesus Christ. I want to know that Christ is the priority within my life. You know these scriptures quite well, but I'd like to give them to you. Romans 3, 23, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. In Romans 6, 23, for the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Don't you like that word gift? Salvation is a gift that you do not have to earn. You just have to accept it. Salvation is a true gift from God. In Romans 5, 8, but God demonstrates his own love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Christ died for us. When I tell you, it was like 100 degrees up there, so I'm sweating big time down here. So I didn't get a chance to cool down a little bit. But God demonstrated his own love toward us, that he died for us. And that baptism is the picture of the death, the burial, and the resurrection of our Lord Jesus Christ. Romans 10, 9, and 10, that if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For with the heart one believes unto righteousness, and with his mouth confession is made unto salvation. Salvation is what we have believed in our heart. We, we speak it, but it's what we believe. And if we believe in Jesus and what he has done for us, there's no problem with publicly proclaiming the love and the forgiveness of Jesus Christ. As I told Lamont, I love second chances. I love that God forgives. I love God takes care of us. I love that if we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all of our unrighteousness, everything that we've ever done. And if we can understand what our salvation is, we can move into the question phase. What do we do? So God grants forgiveness and salvation to every individual. He has died. He purchased, for, he purchased our sins on the cross, and he wants to apply that to our life. In Romans 5, 1, it says, Therefore, having been justified by faith, we have peace with God through Lord Jesus Christ. You know, peace of God. When, when, when you're struggling, when, when you, you feel like you really don't know what to do, there's one thing that we truly desire in our hearts and in our lives is, is true peace. It's peace within our families. It's peace within our spirit. It's peace at work. It's peace in relationships. When we can say, you know, I'm at peace. I'm, I'm content. I'm satisfied. And when we're talking about our spiritual life, when we are content and happy and peaceful in our spiritual life, we can just praise God. We can worship him. We can honor him in what we have done. In John chapter 10, verses 28 and 29, it says this, I have given them eternal life, that they shall never perish, Neither shall anyone snatch them out of my hand. My Father who has given them to me is greater than all, and no one is able to snatch them out of 
my hand. Salvation is an eternal investment that Jesus Christ purchased on the cross, and he has adopted us into his family. And that adoption is secure for eternity. And I love that adoption. It is not something that, oh, you can do it. You can come into the family until you do something wrong. No, you are in God's family. He's adopted you out of Satan's family and put you into God's family. You are adopted into Christ's adoption. I am a child of God, and I have to know that. So what do you do when you know that you're a child of God? Well, you're at Glenville, so I'm going to say this. Join Glenville and let us help with your journey. Join Glenville and let us help with your journey. You know, the greatest thing that a church can do is not come to church on Sunday morning and sing songs and worship. The thing that Glenville can do is change your life. It's build relationships. It's get into people's lives that are hurting and struggling and come up with people that can help them, love them, fellowship with one another, fellowship with each other. And the second thing is, is second purpose is to teach the Bible. And I'm sure that Pastor Al was telling you about the different things that are taking place this starting this Wednesday and on Sunday mornings about getting into classes. If, if sometimes we get so satisfied and content with the knowledge that we have that we never want to grow, we never want to learn. And when we do know something, the key is do we apply what we know? So not only learn it, but apply it and we apply it, that changes everything. And the third purpose, and you just experienced, it wasn't the, the Revelation song, don't you love the Revelation song? The last song, holy, holy, holy. I love be able to praise and worship our Lord. And the church has the privilege of worshiping God. So when you join the church, you have a family, you get to, get to know individuals, we get to teach the Bible, and then we get to worship. In Revelation chapter 4, verse 11, it says, You are worthy, O Lord, to receive glory and honor and power, for you created all things, and by your will all things exist. We get to worship. We get to worship our Lord. Worship is not just music. Worship is our prayer. It's our teaching. It's our reading. Worship is you alone with God. And wherever you are, you can worship God. You can allow God to be the audience of one. And then the third thing is set aside time for a daily focus on God. Set aside a time of daily focus on God. This, when we're answering questions this month, this is a question that I've had many times, a statement that I've had many times. I've been a believer for many years. I just don't know anything about the Bible. Can somebody give me an amen on that? I, I, I've been to church since I've been 15 years old, but really, I don't really know anything, and I really am ashamed that I don't know the Bible. But when we spend a time on a daily basis of, of worshiping, and we spend a time, <laughs> is it that obvious that I'm like sweating like a pig? <laughs> oh my gosh. You think it's hot out? Oh man, I'm crazy. Oh well. Thank you, Doug, for pointing that out in front of everybody. By the way, I do, I do appreciate that. <laughs> So set aside a time a day through prayer. When we pray, prayer is communion with you and God. Vernon Mace, the most awesome man in our church, not because of who he is, because of what he does. He comes in and he prays every morning. He prays for me every day. He loves this church. He has prayed for people he don't even know. He's been praying for my family. He's been praying for you because he is a man of prayer. And when you get prayer within your soul, prayer within your life, it's you talking to God, pleading with God. It allows God to speak through you and for you. And I told him a few weeks ago over in his house, and I'm, you're gonna get mad at me when I say it, but you're gonna hear it anyway. You are the most influential person in this church. Amen. And Vernon, you may not get up here and talk, and you may not say a public prayer, but the power of your prayer is phenomenal, and you are the man at this church because we can't live without you, that's for sure. And then, not only prayer, but it's also Bible reading. Learn what the Bible says. Learn it and apply it and move on from it. And then the fourth thing is develop relationships with people who can help you spiritually. I want to give you one verse. And I, I, as I was a youth pastor for many years, this one verse, I, I, I pounded on my teenagers. I said, guys, you have to know this verse. You have to know this verse. Because relationships matter. Decisions have consequences. 
And in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 33, it says, do not, be de- do not be deceived. Evil company corrupts good habits. Got that? Do not be deceived. You know, don't lie to yourself. Be very self-aware. Evil company or people that do not follow Christ corrupts good habits. In other words, you can't be good if we hang out with bad. How can they agree unless they walk together? What we have to understand is building relationships that honor God, that that take God to the next level, is the priority within our life. Try to find a couple people from your church that you can encourage and that you can encourage them. Hebrews 3, 13, but exhort one another daily while it is called today, lest any of you be hardened through the deceitfulness of sin. And let us consider one another in order to stir up our good gifts. Let us consider each other. You know, those are some things that you can do. And what we did today with these adults and these teenagers is we baptized them. It's a simple thing of, you know, you're in front of four or 500 people and uh, you you get stuck underwater and they're wet and, you know, it's just not very attractive to get baptized in front of all these people. But why do they do it? They don't do it to impress you. They do it to honor God. I am buried in Christ. I am in Christ. I am adopted into Christ. I am not ashamed of Christ. There's going to be times in your life that Christ may ask you to do something that you may not necessarily want to do. You may not even look good doing it, but if you're following after Christ, I am not ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ. I will stand, and if I will not be in a baptism, If I'm afraid to be baptized, if I'm afraid what people may think of me, am I really standing for Jesus Christ? Is it really the first obedient step that I'm following if I am afraid even to be baptized? In Romans chapter 6, verse 34, or do you not know that as many of us were baptized into Christ Jesus, were baptized into his death? Therefore, we were buried with him through baptism into death, that Jesus as Christ that was raised from the dead be glory for the Father. Even so, we also should walk in newness of life. When I baptize, you heard it. I baptize you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, buried in the likeness of his death and raised to walk in what? Newness of life. The power of life. The power of saying, I want Christ to be the priority within my life. When I get baptized, it doesn't do anything for my salvation, but it proclaims who I am. I am a follower of Christ. I am in the family of God. I am going to be protected by God, for God, for the rest of my life, and I'm starting fresh and new. Baptism is an awesome thing. So what are some questions about baptism? Do I need to be baptized in order to become a Christian? Do I need to be baptized in order to become a Christian? You know, you don't. But there's only one place in the Bible where somebody that is a follower of Jesus Christ didn't get baptized, and that's the thief on the cross. But everybody else that's a follower of Jesus Christ was urged to be baptized, to follow after Christ and be baptized. The Bible teaches it is by grace you have been saved through faith. It is not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not by works, so that no one can boast that I did something on my own. I got baptized, so I'm going to heaven. No, you accepted Jesus and what Jesus did on the cross to go to heaven. You were baptized to let people know that Jesus did the work, that I am buried in Christ. It is who he did. It is what he did, not what we have done. Then why should I get baptized? Baptized, baptism is the response that the Bible says of obedience to to Jesus Christ, responding to God's call to become a follower, a faithful disciple, and to be baptized means I am following after Christ. Matthew chapter 28, verse 19, says, go therefore and make disciples of all nations. It says, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Jesus, that's his commandment. Go make disciples, and when you make disciples, baptize them. See, there's a difference between our culture and maybe in India or Southeast Asia or even in Africa. 
when somebody gives their life to Jesus Christ in a third world country or a Muslim country, they say, you know, I'm going to be a proclaimer of Jesus Christ. And they get baptized. They get excommunicated from their home. They get kicked out of the synagogue. It is not as easy as coming to church on Sunday morning and being baptized and say, okay, we're going home. We're going to have a baptismal party tonight. No, they are excommunicated. Our culture in this civilization is celebrates. We clap. We love baptisms. But in a third world country, it means I am standing up in case of my life. I'm standing up for the cause of Jesus Christ. You know what? That is commitment. That is dedication. That is what the real world needs to see, that we are not ashamed of Jesus. What is believer's baptism? Sometimes we come from different churches, denominations, if you would, that baptize babies. That... Uh, when they're born, they christen the baby or they sprinkle the baby. And here what we do is, is we dedicate our children to the Lord. We don't baptize. Our believer's baptism is this. Once you have believed in Jesus Christ, once you've accepted what Jesus Christ did for you, once you understand that Jesus Christ died on the cross for your sins and you can't get to heaven on your own, and I accept him for his salvation, his forgiveness, and I put my life into him, believer's baptism is then I'm going to the baptismal waters, then I'm gonna let the world know that I believe in Jesus Christ. If we were baptized as a baby, if you were baptized as a child, that's a good thing. I just tell everybody, you just took a bath, okay? Because it really isn't, it doesn't do anything because baptism is a proclaim of what Jesus did on the inside. And when you were a child, you didn't know what Jesus did for you. Your parents did. Your parents loved you. Your parents wanted to dedicate you. Your parents wanted the best for you. But I believe, and the Bible teaches, salvation is an individual act upon every person, and your parents can't baptize you into heaven. Jesus has to save you into heaven. And the only way that you're going to get into heaven is not by baptismal waters. Believer's baptism is once I gave my life to Jesus, then I'm going to follow him in believer's baptism. So if you came from a denomination that baptizes a child, your parents meant well. Your parents wanted to keep you safe and keep you secure. But the Bible says salvation is a gift from God. And the Bible says, whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. It is a question that each and every one of us must answer for ourselves. And then what is the difference between immersion and sprinkling? You know, immersion, the Bible says, immersion is translated in the Greek word from baptizo, which means to dip or to immerse. In the Bible's day, it's what we baptize. They went into the river. Even G Jesus was baptized in the Jordan by John the Baptist because there was much water to be there. And I believe that sprinkling occurred because of sometimes the elderly or the sick, and sometimes it was easier to sprinkle than it was to baptize. But any healthy individual that can be baptized, because baptism doesn't take you to heaven, right? Baptism doesn't, whether you were sprinkled or you were baptized, it doesn't change the fact that you're going to heaven. What changes, what does the Bible say I should do? And if, I, if the Bible says I should be immersed, let's go through the death, the burial, and the resurrection of our Lord Jesus Christ. But it doesn't change you. If you've been sprinkled, or if you've been baptized, it doesn't change the fact that you're a follower of Jesus Christ. You just have to do what Christ has asked us to do. In Romans 6, 4, it says, Therefore we were buried with him through baptism into death, that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in newness of life. That's what baptism is all about. But what does it mean? What does it mean? Um, and I love what sometimes baptism means. First thing, it's a cleansing. It's a fresh start. We all need a fresh start every once in a while, don't we? The baptism doesn't wash your sins away. The blood of Jesus Christ washes your sins away. But a baptism, it's a fresh start. I love these families that said she or he need to be baptized, but I want to I wanna start with him. I, I want to take over, and I want to lead the same way we should wash our bodies, God cleanses us from our sins. Baptism is a way of saying publicly we are turning away from our past and we're opening the door to our future 
and we're allowing God to cleanse us and to clean us and to start fresh. And the second thing, it means it's faith. Baptism also in the Bible is people identify themselves as Christians. It's by faith you save, not of yourself. It is the gift of God. And baptism is, I am just going to follow the Lord and believers' baptism because I have faith that Jesus loves me. And then it's the union with Christ. The union of Christ. The Apostle Paul speaks of being united with him in baptism. United. Unseparable. He died for us. He loves us. And he wants us to make a commitment with him. And to the third world country, and to the first world country, to that culture, and to this culture, what baptism is, is Jesus Christ is preeminent. You know when the Bible says the Lord Jesus Christ? The Lord is not his first name. The Lord is his position. The Lord means highest honor. The highest honor. If he is the Lord Jesus and he is our Christ, that means everything is underneath him. My life, my desires, my wishes, my ambitions are under the Lord Jesus Christ. I have no problem with talking to the Lord Jesus because he's more important than me. And he, if we are united into Christ, the Bible says, call unto the Father and say, Father, Abba, Father. You know what that means? Dad, Dad, I need you. Dad, I need your advice. Many of us have our dads with us, but many of us, our fathers have passed. And you know how many times that I just wanted to get on the phone and call dad, and he's not there? Sometimes it's hard, but our earthly father may be gone. But our heavenly father is always we ask not, we have not because we ask not, because God wants us to be right beside us, the union with Christ. Galatians chapter 3, verse 27, for as many of you were baptized into Christ, have put on Jesus Christ. And I love what Ephesians chapter 4, verse 5 says, one Lord, one faith, one baptism. So let me answer a question. There's sometimes that churches say you have to be baptized in this church. So when somebody says, will my baptism count at your church? I say this, were you baptized for the church or were you baptized for Jesus? Because we're not baptized for the church. We're baptized into Jesus. Because we're baptized into Jesus, we get to have the privilege of the church. But if Jesus is not the priority of your baptism. And if it is to get married in the church or if it's some other foolish reason to get baptism, baptized, it doesn't count because baptism is by faith. By faith alone, put Jesus where he needs to live and be. And then it gives us a new life. A new life. In Romans 6, 4, therefore we were buried with him through baptism into death. That just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, so we also should walk in newness of life, raised to walk in the newness of life. We all need to have that. What if you're afraid of the water? What if, what if you almost drowned one time? What if I was baptized in a different denomination? What do I do after I get baptized? You know, there's all kinds of questions about baptism. There's also a lot of questions about salvation. There's a lot of questions about the church. What we want to do is we want to take our life and we want to mold our life into one. We want our church to be a vibrant, loving group of individuals that when 15 people give their life to Christ and get baptized, it excites us. When people stand across the aisle down here and they join the church, it should excite us. The church is not about an individual. The church is about the body. And if the body of Christ is growing and thriving and alive and doing great things for the cause of Jesus Christ, that should motivate us to do great things, to get into people's lives, to love them, and to help them. So our invitation today is very simple. You have to make a decision. And many of you have given your life to Christ and you have followed the Lord in believer's baptism. 
And I say praise Jesus for that. That's the obedience of Jesus Christ. And I believe God wants to bless you. God wants to do great things through you and with you. But until we first take that obedient step and say, are you ashamed of me? I am not ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Then God moves into our life and he blesses us and he does great things for us, through us, and with us because we have identified with him. But if we're ashamed of him, he can't bless us. But when we identify with him, he can do great things through us. So if you've never been baptized... If you have never given your life to Christ, we'd like to give that opportunity for you to give your life to Christ. You know, whether, you know, and I may joke about some people being older than me that were baptized today. Um, but you know what? Sometimes it's very difficult. When you're older, say you're 54, <laughs> old, old over the hill. Until you're 54, I mean, 53 and younger, you're kids, but anything over that. <laughs> but what you have to do is you have to admit, all my life, I did not know the truth, or I did not believe the truth, and sometimes I even l believed a lie. Maybe my parents taught me something, or maybe my church taught me something, and all of a sudden, I'm confronted with truth. And what do I do with the truth? Do I stick my head under the sand and say, wow, that must not be right? Or do I allow the truth, the word of God to impact my life and say, you know what? I need Jesus. I don't just want Jesus. I need Jesus. And once I know I need Jesus, I'm not going to be ashamed of following him in believer's baptism and part of the family of God. The saddest thing that I do sometimes at this church is stand at this spot in front of a casket right here. And I have met with the family and I ask some very difficult questions. And I get two sides to that question. Sometimes I stand here and say, you know, we have no idea about their faith. We don't know whether he went to church. We don't know anything about his life spiritually. And I sat there and I mourn for them because there could be nothing worse than not knowing about their eternal destination. But then I get these other families that I ask them about their questions. And they say, yes, he was saved when he was 17 years old. He gave his life to Christ. He was baptized. He served. He loved Jesus. His favorite scriptures are this and this is what he has done. Man, I'm writing all this stuff down because, man, I, I can do a funeral like that. I can preach somebody to heaven but I have a hard time when somebody is hurting about their spiritual life. When you are done in your life and your family is meeting with the preacher, you want them to know that on a certain day, I gave my life to Christ. On a certain day, I was not ashamed of Jesus and I was baptized into the fellowship and the family of God. It is very important that we know what God has done for us. And this decision is up to you. Let me pray for you as we bow our heads. Dear Father, Lord, we come before you. And Lord, we ask you to pierce our hearts and to decide within our lives what we need. And we need a relationship with you. More than anything else in our life, we need you to be our Lord and our Savior. So Lord, be with us. Open up our hearts. Open up our lives. And with your head bowed, I'm going to ask you a simple question. How many of you have never been baptized? Raise your hand if you've never been baptized. Following the Lord in believer's baptism is one of the most precious things that you can do. These couples, these individuals that were baptized today, there's something about putting yourself in God's family, allowing somebody to baptize you into God's family. I have been saved, but now something very spiritual has happened. I love Christ, and I want Christ to glorify me so I can lift him up. If you've never been baptized, I want to challenge you to call me and talk to me. Call the church. Give your life to Christ and make sure that you are part of his family.